Welcome to Sense and Nonsense A to Z, where we pick topics based off of the letter of the day. Today is episode 14 of season one, featuring the letter N. We're family and we're your hosts, A, T, and Z. So let's get started. I'm sure you know the letter N hello because we joke about it all the time. So let's do it together on a count of three, okay? Okay. All right. One, two, three. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> so May is here. So happy May. Yes, it's lovely. It is. We have a ton of May birthdays in our family and anniversaries yes, too. True. In fact, somebody's birthday is coming up soon. Yes, it is. So we'll talk about that later in the month. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, two things going on this week. Cinco de Mayo is coming up. Love it. Yeah. And a crazy little thing is going on too. Okay. The first Saturday of May, which this year would be May 7th, is Naked Gardening Day. <laughs> oh gosh. Not for me. Ain't happening. No. Sorry. I have a hard enough time keeping sunburn off of like the few <laughs> parts of my body that I do show. I'm not bare ass in it in the garden to get sunburn on my tush. Or I have a hard enough time getting into the garden, no less naked. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So what's going on, Z? I have been watching a ton of movies because of my favorites that I've picked for this week. Oh, okay. And let me tell you something. Some of these people have exhaustive catalogs. You know, you have to pick and choose which ones to see. Do you go with the old ones that are your favorites? Or Classics. do you right. dive into some that you've never seen before and now you have the excuse to do it? So I'm just making a ton of decisions, watching a <laughs> bunch of movies, and right. it's it's been really enlightening, I'm going to tell you. really has this week. Yeah. I've been watching some movies more so than usual. I typically don't watch movies. I usually just watch sports, but, yeah. um, but because we're doing the podcast yeah. and we're talking about movies all the time, it's like, oh, I better start doing some research, no, you know, I better, I better bone up on some of my stuff here, Exactly. you know? So it's been really fun doing that, but it's also a little exhausting. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, it's there's a lot consuming. to see. It, yeah. yeah. And some of these movies are like three hours long. And I'm oh, like, yeah. whoa, that is, that's intense. So, yeah. I have a hard time sitting that long, too. Yeah. You have a little yeah. ADD when it comes yeah, to that. Yeah. Yeah. You? I do. Yeah. I do. No doubt. That's yeah. why sports is perfect because, right. you know, especially baseball, they go to commercial. Well, you know, I run to, into the kitchen or run to the bathroom, whatever I got to do. I, you know what? I love you, but I don't know how you can watch baseball. It's I boring. I love baseball. It's so boring. No, nah, not to me. <laughs> not to me. Because see, I look at the intricacies I into guess. baseball. I know? guess that's, that's movies for me too. Like that's the yeah. difference. You know, yeah. I'm watching for all the little stuff. In the movies. little stuff. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm looking at the kind of pitch the guy throws or how fast the guy is throwing or gotcha. what their average is or what their average is going to be. I used to, I used to keep score. I know. That's true. I used to sit in front of the TV and keep score. I used to figure out people's averages. Yeah. Like, oh, next time he comes up, he's going to be hitting 289. You know? Oh That's my the, goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used yeah. to do that all the time. And by the way, the Mets are doing great. Well, I'm happy for you. Awesome. <laughs> I know you're, you're really happy about a couple of the changes that have recently been made. So the I'm glad changes. they're doing well. Yep. I'm happy. Good. Happy May. Happy baseball. <laughs> <laughs> How about 10 questions and addition? Sounds good. All right. Question number one. Which word do you use when you disagree? No, nah, nope, not a, not. Ooh, it depends on who depends I'm talking to. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You know, sometimes I'll be like, nah. nah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm usually a nah. No. Nah. 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 Nope. Nope. Nah would be the biggest. Nah. Yeah. Okay. Nah. All right. Question number two. Men's beards, natural or neat? Uh, I'll go neat. Me too. I'll go neat. I hate those scraggly things. Yeah. Sometimes it's these. What's with these long beards anymore? I don't know, but sometimes if they're too long, it just looks like... ZZ Top, right? I don't get it. Okay, number three. What is the nastiest smell? 
something rotten in the fridge. A rotting food. Rotting food, I think. Yeah. I can't say poop because I'm so used to poop. <laughs> well, poop is the easy answer. It's the easy answer, but it's yeah. it's not it because when you have a kid and you have pets or something, yeah, you're, yeah. you're kind of used to that. You can't say that. I would say like a rotting food is yeah. the worst because okay. it catches you unawares as well. Yeah. You know, when you open something, you're like, whoa, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Yeah. There's a couple of things. <laughs> yeah. I have a cat that has like really bad teeth. Uh -huh. And it's like, oh my God, I can barely even, I can't even. Yeah. You know, yeah. and she yawns or something. It's uh -huh. like, oh, please. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty nasty. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Old cat. Old yeah. cat mouth. <laughs> yeah. Gross. <laughs> Gross. All righty. Uh, next question. The last time you spoke to your next door neighbor. Oh, this morning. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. I yeah. know, right? M mine was yesterday. How about that? So yep. we're social to our neighbors. Very we good. Are. And we this are. is why I shan't be gardening naked. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. How often do you make notes for yourself? Every day, constantly. Me too. Constantly. All the time. Yep. I, I, I always have post-its going on. Yeah. I mean, constantly I have all to, over the place. Yeah. Alarms yep. on my phone with little notes and stuff. Yep. Oh, yeah. All righty. Uh, next question. Do you tend to do things now or next time? Again, it depends on what it is. You mm -hmm. know, if it's urgent now, if it's not urgent next time. Hmm. For me, you know, it depends. If I can do it now, I, I do it now, no matter what. Like if somebody asks me to do something, okay, let me do it. It's like, no, 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 you don't have to do it right now. I'll do it right now because if I don't do it right now, I will forget. And that's when the post-it note comes in. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I see yeah. that. I tend mm -hmm. to do, yeah, I'll do it now. If I can do it, I do it. I tend to have a lot of things going on. Yeah. So if I don't need to do something now mm -hmm. and I have other stuff to do instead, then mm -hmm. it gets pushed for sure. Mm -hmm. I got to prioritize a lot. Got to prioritize. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question of which I'm borrowing this question from Stephen Colbert. Okay. What number am I thinking of? four. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you got to give me some parameters, like a gajillion. <laughs> there's, there's a Not lot of really. numbers to That's choose from. Just, nope. Nope. There's no parameters. What number am I thinking of is his typical question when he asks. <laughs> And Come then on, he goes Steven. on to the next one. It's like, you're not going to tell me what number you know. No, he no. doesn't. He just goes on to the next. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Has anybody ever got it right that you've seen? No, never, <laughs> never. <laughs> awesome. I think if he asked me that, I would say, I wouldn't give him a number. I would say your favorite number. Oh, good one. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I was thinking number three. Oh, okay. So you're, well, I was close. close. Yeah. Question number eight. When do you feel the most nostalgic? Oh, goodness. Probably when I'm listening to music. I think I feel the most nostalgic. Okay. Yeah. For, for me, it's around Christmas time. See, it's not for me because I have a child and okay. it's all about him now. I think yeah. maybe if I didn't, then it would be more a trip down memory lane. Memor sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Next question. What is your favorite novel? Pride and Prejudice. Oh, mm -hmm. Jane wow. Austen. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very nice. And it didn't become my favorite novel until I was really an adult. Okay. But it, but it's something that I can always go back to and read and enjoy. So mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Do you have one? Well, it would be between To Kill a Mockingbird and The Great Gatsby. And every oh. time I hear, every time I hear The Great Gatsby, there's only one thing that comes to my mind. Robert Redford? Actually, no. Oh, bummer. That's but what that I always, is, I always think that, about. Okay, that is good. No, you're going to know why I'm going this this route. Okay. Rodney Dangerfield in Back to School. Yeah. When she asks him about the Great Gatsby, and he goes, "Hmm, the Great Gatsby. He was great." <laughs> See me after class. You know, it always <laughs> comes down to Back to School. It really does. It kind of does. You know. You know? <laughs> I was thinking about it this morning. Robert Downey Jr. I was, I was <laughs> thinking were? about it this morning. Derek there Lutz, I was thinking about it. Why? I don't know, but so it was funny. there. So funny. <laughs> okay. Last question. Nasty 
or Rhythm Nation? Nasty. Oh, you nasty boy. Yeah, I have that on my um, mix for working out. Do you? Yeah. That's a good song to work out to. It is. You're right. You're right. <laughs> it is for me too. I'd rather do that one than uh, Rhythm Nation. All right. Both are good. Yeah. Both are really good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's it. That was fun. Good. It's all about having fun. It is really. Yeah. I'm going to do my favorite end movie now. Okay. It's The Nice Guys. No. Oh. Have you ever seen that? I have not. Okay. So so fill me in. All right. I'm going to let you know what's up. <laughs> okay. This is a 2016 movie with Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling. Okay. And I'm going to really try and let you know what's going on here, but even the people making the movie have a hard time describing it because <laughs> it's this kind of like complex noir detective story but it also has like comedy and thriller elements okay so it's it's kind of mixed up but it's a lot of fun i find it to be a lot of fun okay all right it takes place in the 70s in los angeles and russell's character jackson healy is a heavy and he winds up hiring ryan's character holland march who is an ex-cop private investigator he hires him to find a missing girl who had hired him previously. And they wind up teaming up not only to find the girl, but to solve the case of an apparent suicide of a porn star by the name of Misty Mountains. Are you lost yet? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So Misty Mountains' aunt, Lois Smith's character, says that she saw her in her home after her quote-unquote death. Specifically, she saw her writing at a desk in a blue pinstripe jacket, okay? Okay. So this leads the Ryan Gosling character, Holland March, to find Amelia because he thinks Amelia was there, right? Okay. But Amelia thinks that he's after her because she's got a lot of people after her. So she hires Russell's character, Jackson Healy, to scare off Ryan's character, <laughs> Okay. Wow. He's just trying to interview her, but she thinks he's trying to kill her. So okay. Russell goes to his house to scare him off, but you know, he's not just taking it. So he winds up breaking his arm. Is that why that? Okay. Cause so he, I saw the, I saw the, yeah, photo. he breaks his arm yep. and he's like, stay away from Amelia. And he, and, and Ryan's character is like, fine, I'm off the case. Fine, fine, fine. Whatever. Right. But then Russell goes home and there's a couple of other heavies waiting for him, led by Keith David's character. And they're looking for Amelia and they beat up Russell Crowe and kind of wreck his apartment a little bit. So now he thinks there's more going on than meets yeah. the eye. Yeah. And he's like, he can't get in touch with Amelia now. And now he's a little bit worried. And so that's why he hires Ryan's character. Wow. But Ryan's <laughs> very wary of him, right? And he's sure. like, what do you want? You know? Yeah. But money talks and mm -hmm. he hires him and they kind of go on this weird adventure of trying to solve these cases that they're finding are interconnected. And Ryan's character, March, he really prides himself on being a functional alcoholic, okay? <laughs> and he's got a daughter and her name is Holly and she's played by Anjuri Rice and okay. she's 13 years old and she is awesome. She is very good. She's grown up in a way that kids tend to be when they're raised by a parent who is neglectful and kind of a mess. You know what I mean? Like, sure. She's sure. driving the car because he can't. And, you know, <laughs> she's reminding him that he has to work today, stuff like that, you know? Wow. <laughs> he, he's a mess because his wife died in a fire and he feels like it's his fault because he had an accident and he lost his sense of smell and he couldn't detect the leak in the furnace. Mm. So he's got a lot of guilt over that. And he like, he says things to her, like, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to tell me the truth and don't take it easy on me just because I'm your father. Am I a bad person? And she <laughs> goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> As if to say like, duh, you know, you're terrible. <laughs> he, she's proud of him that he's a PI, but she doesn't want him to make a fool of himself. So she's always busting his chops, like saying he's the worst detective in the world and everything. <laughs> and 90% of the time he is a schmuck. 
you know, even okay. according to Ryan, he is. But then once in a while, he has these moments where everything comes into focus and he actually figures something out. He's actually a pretty good PI. Okay. So Amelia, her boyfriend, the porn star Misty Mountains, and a producer named Sid Shattuck get together and make an expose porn movie where they expose the catalytic converter corruption between the big three auto companies in Detroit and the head of the Justice Department, who is supposedly prosecuting them for their knowingly poisoning the air. Hmm. Why would they do this, you ask? Why would they do this? <laughs> because <laughs> Amelia's mother, who is Kim Basinger's character, Judith Kuttner, is oh. the head of the Justice Department. Oh, and okay. she is really PO'd about her hypocritical mother. Hmm. So, and kind of in tandem with the catalytic converter case, she also is prosecuting all the porn that's taking over Hollywood. So mm -hmm. she, this mm -hmm. is like a double whammy for her to embarrass her mother in oh. like both ways and stuff. Okay. So. Okay. so both Justice and Detroit are very upset about this film and they never wanted to see the light of day because it's got names, dates, and all kinds of evidence in it exposing the corruption these heavies, these people from Detroit or whatever, burned down the filmmaker's house, which is Amelia's boyfriend's house, okay. with him and the film in it. Oh. So then they also killed Misty and Sid Shattuck. Oh. And since Amelia is proving hard to kill, they send Matt Bomer's character to Los Angeles. He is a savage fixer assassin. And his code name is John Boy. And he's there to take her out. And he does. And he causes a lot of problems for the nice guys also because they figure out that another copy of the film exists. Mm. This is how Lois Smith's character saw Misty in her house because Amelia was screening the film against the wall in her house. And when she was driving up, she saw her there in the pinstripe jacket. Mm. So that's how they figure okay. this out. Okay. So Holly makes March, who is Ryan Gosling's character, pinky swear <sighs> that he is going to find the film. And as we know, a pinky swear is a seriously binding contract, right? It is. It is. Who knows the horrors that will befall you if you <sighs> break a pinky swear? So he's in it now. He's got to work for this one. So they're at the LA Auto Show. Okay. And the film is going to be screened there. They find out it's going to be oh, screened there. Okay. Exposing this whole business, sure, right? Sure. Got it. So in the process of trying to get this film, he falls off the roof of like a 15-story building into a pool. <laughs> he gets shot at multiple times. He gets the film. Then they shoot him in the film canister. <laughs> then he falls out of a, another window onto another low roof, then through a skylight onto the roof of a car, loses the film. Then a guy slams into him that's running because of all the crazy things that are going on. Then he gets hit by a car from people fleeing the mayhem at the auto show. Then another guy gets the film. Then he tackles the guy who gets the film. All kind of stuff is blowing up behind him, but he's dogged in his pursuit because he's made this pinky swear. Right. He's duck running after the film and he finally gets it. And triumphantly raises the film up to Holly as the cavalry of cops arrive late to the party, as they always do, right? Right. <laughs> and now the pinky swear is fulfilled. So he, he's released of that covenant. Right. And Holly is the moral center of this film. She also keeps Russell Crowe's character on the straight and narrow by keeping him from killing John Boy, even though John Boy is very much trying to kill all of them. Right. So Judith gets fired and through her trial, whatever, she winds up going to prison, but she predicts that nothing will have changed. Whoever takes her place is going to do exactly what she was supposed to do because okay. she's there to maintain the status quo and protect the big three automakers. Right. And that's Kim Basinger's Judith, That is right? Kim Basinger's Got character. It. Got it. Okay. And she's right. The automakers get off. They cite that there's not enough evidence of collusion, just as she predicted. And, you know, the world keeps turning. But the Nice Guys agency is formed with the two of them. Oh, so they that's where the name, I was up. wondering where the name comes in here. Okay, yes, got it. because they're the now Nice Guys. And it. their next case is finding out if some lady's husband is sleeping with Linda Carter. 
Uh, really? Yes. And he's 82. So it's time sensitive. <laughs> it's a fun movie. Um, there's boobs in it. If you watch the unrated version. Well, Misty Mountains, right? <laughs> yes. There's boobs, there's right. cursing, and there's tobacco usage, and obviously there's alcohol. So if you're sensitive to those kinds of things, you're not going to want to watch this movie. Otherwise, I suggest it because I love it. I watch it a lot. And Russell Crowe has said on Howard Stern that he wished there was a sequel to this movie because he really liked playing the character. And that only happened to him one other time that he wished there was a sequel. Wow. So Shane Black, the guy who wrote and directed this, also wrote uh, Lethal Weapon and oh. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang with Val Kilmer and RDJ. He also directed Iron Man 3 and Robert Downey Jr. has an uncredited cameo in this movie playing the murdered Sid Shattuck. Yeah. Which March and Healy carry to the edge of Sid's property and dump him over the fence on so a he very he has, he has no speaking part? Party. He's, He's dead. No He's, He's dead. dead. He's just a dead guy. He's just a carry. dead guy. That's hysterical. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Um, this movie won a Golden Schmoes Award for the most underrated movie of the year. And I want to mention that because I think this is true. This is an underrated movie. It's hmm. really good. I don't think it gets the credit it deserves. And it also won a Golden Trailer for the most original trailer. And I'm mentioning that because we've mentioned trailers before. Mm -hmm. And this is we a have. really good trailer. And okay. also... Because Long Cool Woman in a Black Dress by the Hollies plays over it. And I have previously mentioned that's one Love of my that song. favorite songs. I do. I like it too. Yeah. You did. You did. Yes. So I really love this movie a lot. It's wrong to say, but it's actually a feel-good movie for me. <laughs> I love watching it. And I think these two guys. And interestingly, like... I'm not a big Ryan Gosling fan. I'm yeah. not such a big fan of a lot of the things he's done, but mm -hmm. I absolutely adore him in this movie. I think oh. he's fantastic. And the little girl, Anjuri Rice, she's, she's phenomenal as well. Hmm. All right. So that was my favorite end movie, The Nice Guys. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Here's my favorite letter end movie. The Naked Gun from the Files of Police Squad. It's the first one of the series from 1988. Fun. Yeah. So the whole series is a police spoof comedy. Yes. A bit slapstick. <laughs> yeah, I would say very much so. Yeah. 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 But specifically, the first one is the one I'm going to talk about. Okay. They were all written by David Zucker, Jim Abrams, and Jerry Zucker. Hmm. They were all centered around police detective Frank Drebin, who was played by Leslie Nielsen and was hysterical yeah he was funny he was great this story was about the queen elizabeth visit to the u.s on her goodwill tour mm -hmm. police squad was a special division of the la police department and was assigned to provide extra security for the queen at the same time there was an attempted murder of one of their own detectives nordberg mm. who was who was played by oj simpson by yeah. the way he was working undercover for a wealthy bad guy named Vincent Ludwig, played by Ricardo Maltabon. <laughs> this is all coming back to you now, Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> the captain of the squad was Ed Hawken, who was played by George Kennedy, and oh he was goodness. so funny. Oh, my goodness. And, of course, Lieutenant Frank Drebin worked on the police squad, who wasn't too bright and constantly had mishaps. The main suspect for Nordberg's case was Ludwig. So Frank went over to his office to poke around and ask questions. Mm -hmm. It ended up that he not only attempted to have Nordberg killed, but he was also plotting to assassinate the queen. Oh, my goodness. During the interrogation, a bunch of things happened. I'm not going to get into all that, but Ludwig tells Drebin that he'll cooperate in any way and can offer his assistant, Jane Spencer, played by Priscilla Presley, who's a bit naive and has no idea what her boss is doing mm -hmm. to pull some employment records for Drebin. So this way he can review them. So here comes one of the silly parts. So she's wearing a dress, right? Uh-huh. And she climbs up this ladder to get to an attic where they store all these records. And all you can see is her bottom half. You can't see her top half because she's in the attic, right? Uh-huh. And Frank is looking up at what she's doing. And he says to her, nice beaver. <laughs> and of course you're going, 
huh? Oh my God. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then she's in the attic and you can hear her say, thank you. I just had it stuffed. And you're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and then you see her handing down a stuffed beaver to him. <laughs> so silly stuff. Yeah. Just really silly. Uh, the mayor, her name was Lillian Barkley, had a press conference about the Queen's visit. So Frank was asked to say a couple words. He was given um, a clip on Mike. So he made his comments and ran into the men's room because he was drinking a lot of water. They showed specifically something that was yeah. part of this thing. Yeah, right? setting up the gag. They were, they were. Yeah. So he had a hot mic in the men's room <laughs> <laughs> and the mayor is trying to talk. Uh huh. And all you can hear is Frank in the men's room <laughs> peeing <laughs> and farting <laughs> and singing. <laughs> and then there's this one part that you think he's done. And she, yeah. and everybody in the press conference is like, waiting okay, for it. Waiting for it, right? <laughs> he's done. And then she goes to talk and then <laughs> he starts peeing some more. It's so funny. It's just so funny. Another quick little thing I wanted to mention is, um, there was a banquet that the queen was attending and Frank thought she was in danger because an antique gun was being presented to her by that bad guy, Ludwig. Mm -hmm. So he runs and leaps onto the queen. They both slide across a long buffet table. And then at the end, the whole bunch of photos are taken of him on top of her and her legs wrapped around him, uh -huh. which did not go over very well with the mayor. And, no. the mayor, and then the mayor had him kicked off the force. Ooh. But the captain secretly kept him on the case because they had learned that there was a plot to kill the queen at my favorite part, the angels baseball game, my favorite part, <laughs> of course. So the queen gets announced when she comes into the stadium. So she's walking it to her special section with the mayor and there's like Royal chairs set up in this roped special section. Uh -huh. right? Yeah. And then, and then you see these two grubby fans sitting in the seats, hanging out in those chairs, <laughs> eating with their feet up. <laughs> you know, it's like typical, right? Uh -huh. And then there's some other close-ups of the queen doing the wave, <laughs> passing hot dogs, passing the beers down the aisle. Real funny. So Drebin gets to the stadium and he has to figure out somehow to get on the field. So he's in the tunnels mm -hmm. and he sees the opera singer who's scheduled to do the national anthem. His name was Enrico Palazzo. He knocks him out with a karate chop to the neck and puts on his tuxedo. And then he's led to the field where the mic stand is as Enrico Palazzo to sing the national anthem. Uh -huh. Of course he starts singing. He's out of tune. He doesn't know the words. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, da, da, da. <laughs> and the bombs in the air <laughs> and we still had our flag <laughs> <laughs> he realizes that the stadium security is after him <laughs> so he ends it and then runs off the field so now he's determined that he's got to get back on that field yeah so he sees the umpires in the tunnel he clunks the home plate umpire over the head with a bat, takes his uniform, takes his gear, and it goes on the field and goes behind the plate. <laughs> Great. So as the players interact with him, he's patting him down. <laughs> so the game starts. The first pitch is an obvious strike and everybody's waiting for him to make a call, right? Yeah. And he's just sitting there like a fan behind the catcher. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the, and then the whole stadium is quiet. And then the catcher stands up and looks at him and he looks at the catcher. He says, strike. <laughs> and then the whole stadium starts cheering. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm into it now. Right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and the next pitch, then he goes, strike two. <laughs> he twirls around, twirls around, does the moonwalk. <laughs> and then the pitcher throws the next pitch. Before it even crosses the plate, he goes, strike three. <laughs> Absolutely love that part. <laughs> so anyway, during that whole game thing, they figured out that the hit on the queen was going to occur at the end of the game. So there was a whole bunch of things that happened. They were trying not to end the game, that sort of thing. But anyway, game ended. The bad guy, Ludwig, had developed a hypnotic device that turns people into murderers. Oh gosh. 
The sleeper of this was Reggie Jackson, who was playing the outfield. He was yeah. hypnotized. And then when the game was over, he would go grab a gun that was under one of the bases, go over to the queen like a zombie, and shoot the queen. Uh -huh. Drebin had been given these cufflinks that shoots a knockout dart. So he sees Jackson go over to the queen with a gun. So Drebin shoots him with a dart, which ricochets to a heavyset woman in the upper deck who falls, tumbles on top of Reggie Jackson. Oh my goodness. And then the mayor says, the umpire saved the queen. <laughs> and then the captain's right next to her and he says, no, 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 that's not the umpire. That's Frank Drebin. <laughs> and then this is my favorite part of the movie. You see on the big screen, there's a close-up of Frank as he takes off the umpire's face mask. And a fan jumps up and says, hey, it's Enrico Palazzo. <laughs> so this movie is just a laugh out loud, funny movie. Yeah. I love it. So many different parts. And yeah. uh, hope, hopefully I did it some justice. Oh, you have I, me laughing. Okay. I'm giggling the whole time because it's just so funny. My favorite. It's good to have fun ones like that. I think it's time for a sense or nonsense little game that we do. What do you okay. think? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sure. Okay. So today's letter N category uh -huh. is drum roll <laughs> nuts. Nuts. And not the cuckoo kind. Not the oh nuts. Not that kind. <laughs> not that kind. Okay. No. Okay. Sense or nonsense? Allergy to nuts is the most common allergy. Yes, I would say sense. No, it's got to be, it's got to be pollen, right? It is pollen. Ah, <laughs> I said pollen. that before I thought about it. <laughs> pollen allergies are the most common allergies in the world. Tens of millions of Americans suffer from pollen allergies. Nuts is the second most common. Okay. Sense or nonsense? China is the top producer of nuts in the world. Are, are soybeans a nut? A legume? I don't think they're considered a nut. That's a good question. Would you like me to look that up for you? No. <laughs> Maybe okay, later. So, um, Maybe later. I'll, okay. I'll say, I'll say uh, sense. It is sense. First, it's China, then Mexico, then Indonesia, then the U.S. Hmm. Yeah. And we'll circle back on that. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's right. find that out for a future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sense or nonsense? Brazil nuts don't come from Brazil. That would be messed up if that was the case. Nonsense. You're right. Most Brazil nuts do come from Brazil, but Bolivia is a close second. And then comes Peru. I'm going to tell you something. I love Brazil nuts. I, I love do too. Brazil nuts. They are high in magnesium, fiber, and selenium. They're yeah, my they're favorite. Good. They're really good for you. Yeah. They're my yeah. favorite. They're hard to get. And even if they ever come into mixed nuts, mm -hmm. they, uh, they're like four of them in the whole mix. Yeah, I agree. I know. Like, it's like, hell? come on. Yeah. I, yeah, I have a question. I have a question for you. Okay. Since, um, we're doing nuts, nuts and you love peanut butter. I love peanut butter. My question to you is yes. chunky or smooth, smooth. If I'm going to eat peanut butter. It's got to be smooth. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. I like the honey roasted. Mm. Yeah. Gives it an extra little. A little, uh, little something. little taste. Little, little, yeah. It gives it an extra little something. You know what I mean? Yeah. A little something, something. When I did eat peanuts, I always ate honey roasted peanuts. Yeah. I like them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All so right. a few, a few things about different nuts. Okay. Peanuts aren't actually nuts. They're considered legumes that mm -hmm. you had referred to. Mm-hmm. Peanuts account for two thirds of all nut consumption. Americans spend eight hundred million dollars a year on peanut butter. Oh which my is the, god! Eight hundred million, which is the most popular nut butter. Well, I mean, I guess because they give it to their kids for lunches oh, and yeah. school yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's easy too. Yeah, you know, put it on crackers, put it on bread. It could be a snack. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Just scoop it. You know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pine nuts get their name because they're found inside of pine cones. Really? I love them. I do too. And they're yeah. expensive too. They are. You can see a little, little teeny bag. It's like 10 bucks for this know, little ridiculous. teeny, like two ounce bag. Yeah. 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 I used to put it in her stuffing. 
Ooh. at Thanksgiving. Yummy. Mm-hmm. I make an orzo salad with the pine nuts, toasted pine nuts, actually. Ooh, yummy. It's delish. Love it. Yeah. Almonds can't grow on their own. They need honeybees to pollinate. Oh, it's interesting. interesting, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 40% of almonds go to chocolate manufacturers. Do almond joy? I like Probably. almond joy. Yeah, I do too. And the clusters and stuff. Yeah. I can, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Cashews are in the same plant family as poison ivy and poison sumac. Holy cow. Their itchy oil is contained in the shell, which is very toxic. Mm. Cashews are actually a fruit. They're a seed of the cashew apple, which kind of looks like a small pear. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. And being a fruit, the same is true for pistachio. Wow. And and their green color comes from being rich in antioxidants. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Macadamia nuts are never picked. They're harvested from the ground when they fall off the trees. That's awesome. And they're the hardest shell of all the nuts. Huh. A couple delicious. Of, I love them. They're expensive yeah. too. Yeah, they're very. By the way, they're yeah. very toxic to dogs too. Macadamia. Huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, pecans are in the top fifteen antioxidant-rich foods. So then, it's good for me to eat pecan pie. Absolutely. Okay. Chestnuts are the only nuts that contain vitamin C. That's wild. Yeah. Walnuts date back to ten thousand BC. Wow. Is that, that's incredible, isn't it? That's why they're in so many Greek dishes. I think so too. Walnuts have the most omega-3s than any other nut. And lastly, ancient Greeks believed hazelnuts could treat coughing and baldness. Well, you might as well have an excuse to eat them because they're good. With Too bad they didn't have chocolate back then. That would have oh, been good. yeah. Chocolate hazelnut. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love them all. I love all nuts. I do. Yeah. I I like lots of them. I I like them more now, I think, than I did when I was a kid. I had a very narrow repertoire of nuts when I was young, Hmm. but now it's larger, but I don't eat peanuts now. Yeah. I like cashew butter. I do too. It's nice and and it's nice and smooth. It is. Yeah. yeah. I like that with apples. Mm -hmm. Yummy. Mm -hmm. Do you do apples with um, peanut butter? I don't eat peanut butter anymore. At at all? No. I don't buy it. No. Huh? No, no. Little I guy need... doesn't like it, right? Little guy won't go near it. No. <laughs> oh, well. He, if you ask him what is the worst smell, he might say peanut butter. <laughs> P-U. <laughs> yeah. Because he smells everything before he eats it, you know? If it doesn't smell good, he's like, nope, I'm out. T- typical kid. Yeah. Let me, let me smell this first yeah. before I put it in my mouth. He smells everything. He smells pretzels. He smells everything. Oh, man. So if it doesn't smell like it's in his liking, nice, it's mm-mm. not going in his mouth. No, yeah. So peanut butter is like out. <laughs> so that's it. Nuts. I like it. Nutty oh, nuts. Nuts. And nuts. My favorite and actor, actress, okay. okay, is Nicole Kidman. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was born June 20th, 1967 in Honolulu, Hawaii. How about that? Yeah, she's got dual citizenship here in Australia. And according to the book, June 20th is the day of ecstatic appeal. Hmm. And it says June 20 people have a way of arousing strong emotions and bringing others out. Exceptional people born on this day can even experience or allow others to experience a loss of rational orientation or a heightened state. And I think that's a pretty good thing to have in an actor. That birthday book is right on. It's right on. And I want to mention a couple other people that were born on this day because it kind of, there's a little trend. Okay. Cindy Lauper, mm-hmm. Lionel Richie, hmm. Errol Flynn, hmm. Brian Wilson. How about that? Chet Atkins, Danny Aiello, and Olympia Dukakis. Isn't that something? A lot of great artists were born on June 20th. Cool. So I first saw her in Days of Thunder in 1990. Mm-hmm. She was really good in that film. I liked her a lot. And we know that she met uh, Tom Cruise there, and they were married that same year. Right. They had adopted two kids, and they seemed strong for about a decade, but 
they cited career differences and they divorced in 2001. Things happen. Yeah. So the first movie that I really loved that she did was Practical Magic in 1998 with Sandra Bullock. Mm -hmm. I love this movie. They play sisters that come from a witchy family. She plays Jillian and she's got massive sex appeal. And Sandra is Sally, who's more grounded and family oriented. And they're in this movie with Stockard Channing and Diane Weist and Aidan Quinn. And I love this movie and it didn't do very well, but it is now considered a cult classic. <laughs> I, I know. I love that. You For know, it's funny movie. how many movies we've discussed that have become cult classics. Yes. Isn't that weird? That's, yeah. that's, that's where my giggle came from. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I tend to like the cult classic yeah. ones better yeah. than sometimes the big blockbuster. I remember seeing her in Days of Thunder and saying, isn't that the girl from Dead Calm? Yes. You know? Yeah. I mean, she's been in a lot of great movies, like yeah. even movies that I really like a lot. And mm -hmm. part of the problem with her, if it is a problem, is that there's too much, mm. you know? And so I figured that I would only go with the ones that were really special to me, yeah. not the ones that yeah. she was good in, because she's good in a lot. She's good all the time. Yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah. I like her yeah. a lot. The, the next movie I'm going to talk about really quickly was The Hours. Okay. And she played Virginia Woolf, who was unstable as she wrote Mrs. Dalloway. And the movie tells a tale of how that novel specifically affected three generations of women who had to deal with suicide or suicidal themes. Okay. And Meryl Streep and Julianne Moore were in that film as well. And what I liked about it is three that strong women. Very. And yep. they were they were all dealing with a lot of issues. I liked what Nicole did in this movie and what she had to go through. Like she learned how to write right-handed because she's naturally a lefty, but mm -hmm. Virginia Woolf is right-handed. And she wrote, of course, she wrote out all of her novels and everything right. longhand. Right. So right. she did that. She also had, wore a fake nose and <laughs> she would wear that on the street. So Would that she? people wouldn't recognize her. Yeah. That's cool. Because there was a lot of paparazzi going on around that sure. time um, because she was divorcing yeah. Tom. And they would leave her alone when she was wearing the nose because they didn't recognize her. There you awesome? go. <laughs> get a nose, get some glasses. I know, right? Maybe a hat too. Yeah. I know. She won the Best Actress Academy Award for her performance in this movie. Yep. And yep. she was the first Australian actress to win the Best Actress Academy Award. Oh, how about that? So then I love her in Just Go With It in 2011. This is an Adam Sandler movie. Mm -hmm. And I love this film. It's mm -hmm. so silly, I but I too. love it. And Nicole plays Devlin Adams, who is Jennifer Aniston's character's frenemy from college. And... She plays opposite Dave Matthews as a couple. And they're right. so funny. They're just so over the top ridiculous in their one upmanship about how much they love each other. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but I really, I just love it. It's so much fun. It's silly. And um, it's a departure for some from some of her more serious roles that she takes, mm -hmm. which she's also very good in. Um, and I'm going to mention right now, one of my favorite things that she's ever done was Big Little Lies. Okay. And this was uh, an HBO series. They actually won the rights in a bidding war against Netflix for it. Hmm. It's 14 episodes from 2017 to 2019. And she produced and starred in this with Reese Witherspoon. It won eight primetime Emmys. And there, it was nominated a bunch of times for a bunch of stuff, like over mm -hmm. 100 times. There are a ton of great people in this series. Shailene Woodley, Zoe Kravitz, Laura Dern, Adam Scott, Alexander Skarsgård, and I've got to mention Ian Armitage, who plays young Sheldon. He's in this yeah, as well. Yeah. And the description of the series is the apparently perfect lives of upper-class mothers at a prestigious elementary school unravel to the point of murder when a single mother moves to their quaint Californian beach town. It's based on a book, which was a number one New York Times bestseller written by Leon Moriarty. She also wrote and produced this series with David E. Kelly. So this series did a great job depicting some of the issues that women deal with regularly, but don't get talked about a lot. Okay. And that usually don't get shown in any kind of realistic way on the screen. 
They are dealing with uh, issues of abuse in relationships, infidelity, stay-at-home moms versus working moms, projecting a perfect image, dealing with bullying and with false accusations, protecting their children, all, all of these things. And it's all very well acted to the point of sometimes it takes your breath away <laughs> or you jump in its brutal honesty because you're not expecting it to be so honest. Honest, sure. Um, especially some of the violence, it's really um, startling in some ways. And I <laughs> I felt bad for Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman is extraordinary in this series. She is an abused wife mm -hmm. and Alexander Skarsgård plays her husband. He is shocking in his brutality and it's supposed to be shocking and it's good to know that you know you read things and afterwards it's like he would be <laughs> asking her if she's okay after every take and you know making sure that she was all right because it was so brutal you know sometimes she was just laying on the floor and she wouldn't get up between takes because it was so emotionally taxing wow um yeah it was really hard you know she had a meltdown a couple of times he he refused to stay in a hotel room he had to stay with friends during this so that he when the day was over, he wasn't alone and he could oh, shake no off kidding. that character because the character is, br he's brutal. He's brutal. Right. Right. So it, it's interesting to see that these things are important to play on the screen and have them played out, but how they affect even the actors that are doing this for fake, you know, yeah. and the toll it takes on them. Well, that's getting into the character. It is. And I mean, it's not just getting into the character, it's but then being able in. to get out of the character, yeah. which is really tough. Um, you know, both are equally necessary and difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's really just a spectacular job. And at the end of the first season, especially, you see these women that don't necessarily get along with each other or have spent the whole season either bickering or actively working against one another close ranks when one of them is being physically abused and they fight with all they've got to protect one another even at the cost of their own physical safety and it was beautiful and touching and brutal and amazing all at one time it was the ending was really of the first season especially was really impactful and it's one I'm not likely to forget. You know, it's one that I think is probably going to stay with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just really nice. The second season, they had some stuff and it was good and everything. But the first season was perfection. It really mm -hmm. was. It's one of the last things that I've seen her do. I saw her do Bombshell. Um, yes. and, and there have been some other stuff where she's been really incredible as a dramatic actor, as good as she is and everything, this mm -hmm. one eclipses everything that I've ever seen her do. Hmm. So. Did you see The Undoing? Did you watch that? Series? No, I didn't because it deals with dead children and I have a really hard time with, with yeah, I yeah. Can't, I, you know, I'd love to see. There are some other things that she's done, like The Undoing. There's another one that deals with the loss of a child. And I just, I just can't watch that stuff since I've had my son. I just mm -hmm. can't. It's too okay. hard. Okay. Yeah. She was, did you see she, it? I did. She was excellent. Of course. You know, course. I mean, it's almost it's, a given, yeah. you know, it's like doing Meryl Streep again. Yeah. You know? I hear you. Meryl yeah. Streep. It's a given that she's mm -hmm. excellent. Even if you don't like the movie, she right. is good in it, you know? Right. And I find that to be the case with Nicole Kidman anymore as well. I don't mean to jump on this, but you're referring to something exactly what I'm going to say. Mm. I don't think you watched the Ricardos either. Did you? I didn't watch it yet. No. I grew up in that time frame, so I yeah. know the story. And I had my doubts that she was going to play Lucy. I really did. Mm -hmm. She did such a great job. But I think the story wasn't well written. But her acting was impeccable. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm finding that to be the case, mm -hmm. you know, and, and most of the things that I've seen with her. There, there have been instances where, you know, I think one or two times I was like, eh, she wasn't really that good in that. But I don't know if that's down to her or if it's down to the script, honestly. She's sure. proven herself so many times that yeah. you got to give her the benefit of the doubt. I think so. So that was my favorite and actress, Nicole Kidman. Cool. Yeah. I like her a lot too.
let's talk about one of my favorite singers. And it's going to be a female singer. Great. Letter N, last name, Stevie Nicks. Oh, fantastic. Love her. Yeah. She was born Stephanie Lynn Nicks. Born on May 26, 1948, which happens to be my anniversary. <laughs> I'll never forget her birthday now. Now, yeah. She's an amazing singer, an amazing songwriter with a very unique voice. Absolutely. She was a big fan of Grace Slick and Janis Joplin. You can and hear that. Exactly. I can hear it in her singing for yeah. sure. She began her career with her boyfriend, Lindsey Buckingham. Yeah. And they had some success. Love, yeah, they did. In 1975, Fleetwood Mac needed a guitarist, and they asked Lindsey Buckingham to join, and he said he would, provided that they take Stevie Nicks as well. Yeah. So their first album with Fleetwood Mac was in 1975. The album is called Fleetwood Mac, but it's also referred to as the White Album. Okay. Her two songs that she wrote on it was two of my favorite songs that she's ever written, was Rhiannon mm -hmm. and Landslide. Well, I think there are probably two of the most famous songs of hers. I got to agree think, with you. Right? Yeah. I mean, everybody of a They're certain huge. age knows yeah. these yeah. songs. Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Their second album, which was the pinnacle, 1977, was Rumors. Yeah. Went multi-platinum. Also got the Grammy for the album of the year. Should have. Absolutely. And is one of the best-selling albums of all time. Mm-hmm. Her songs on that album, Dreams, Gold Dust Woman, and I Don't Want to Know. Mm -hmm. Good songs. All great songs. Their impact helped them be the best-selling artists of all time. Well, it was the right move for them to take both of them. For sure. Over 100 million records sold worldwide. In that group, at that point, they had three strong songwriters. They had Christy McVie, Lindsey Buckingham, and Stevie Nicks. Mm-hmm. All three, amazing. And their voices sound amazing when they're harmonizing, too. Yeah, it was definitely the right move. Absolutely. And the girls had a really strong bond. Nix had said in an interview that the two girls were a force of nature. Yeah, they were. And, they you really know, were. this was a really trailblazing band. I mean, Stevie Nicks herself was incredible and a mm -hmm. trailblazer. But yeah. them together, the way they worked cooperatively, it was amazing. Two of my favorite singers. Mm -hmm. I love Christine very much. Yeah. She has such a smooth, easy voice. Yeah. Well, that you song, know? The Chain, is amazing. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So in 1979, while they were recording Tusk, Stevie Nicks had such a backlog of songs because, you know, everybody was trying to get their songs on the album, and she only had a couple mm -hmm. that made the album. Her main one was Sarah, another great song. She also started doing some branching out, and she did some duets and some backups with some other artists. With Kenny Loggins, she did Whenever I Call You Friend. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Egan, Magnet and Steel. Gold with John Stewart, and not the John Stewart that you <laughs> I know. <we're laughs> the singer John Stewart. Yeah. And she also did some appearances with Tom Petty. So she started evolving at that point. Then in 1981, while she was still with the band, she started recording for an album. The studio album was called Belladonna, which went multi-platinum. Mm, it's good. At that point, Rolling Stone named her the reigning queen of rock and roll. Wow. The biggest song was Stop Drag My Heart Around with Tom Petty, of which is the only track that she didn't write because Tom Petty wrote that song. Oh, he did? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He, he he gave her most of the lyrics, too. He doesn't oh, have that yeah. many. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, other notable songs on that album, Edge of Seventeen, which was Great. huge. Yeah. Leather and Lace that she did with Don Henley. Love that song. It makes me mm -hmm. cry, that song. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so vulnerable. I like, yeah. I'm always Very in sweet tears song. when I hear that song. Yeah. yeah. And then the next album she did in 1983, which was her second one, The Wild Heart, Stand Back is the main song. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to go into her style. Okay. So she's she's five foot one. Yeah, she's a little with heels on. She's like five three, right? Well, she's so, probably she probably wears. Well, wait. There's a reason I'm bringing. Okay. This up because when she stands next to Mick Fleetwood, who's six six, she felt a little ridiculous standing next to somebody 
six subs. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good thing that he was sitting down most of the time. Yeah, exactly. So that's why she always wore six inch platforms. Even when they were out of style, she didn't care. She always wore the six inch platforms. And she also developed a style that she called her uniform. Mm -hmm. Looking at her style, it's a little like a, I don't know, witchy look. It's a know? witchy. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a hundred percent witchy. Yeah. yeah. To the point that in the beginning of her career, she started getting mail accusing her of witchcraft. You're kidding. No. And she just blew it off, kind of figured that it was some wacky people writing her or that sort of thing. You're a witch, you're a witch. And her response was like, no, I'm not. I just like wearing black because it makes me look thinner, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> but it got out of hand and yeah. it really scared her. Yeah, but so, so for a little while, you gave up wearing black and you'll see some of the videos, you'll see some pastels, like a pastel peachy and a pastel green. Yeah. She did that purposely yeah. and she was totally not comfortable with those I was going to say, I bet she wasn't. No, she wasn't. Then, I hate that. I hate that for yeah, her. Yep. Absolutely. Then in 1983, she went back to the black. I guess she either got extra security or whatever, but yeah, she, she got scared. I don't blame her, but that really sucks for either. her. I know. So before a major tour in 1986, she had some issues with her nose. And I was trying to look at some videos because I seem to remember that she had nosebleeds, hmm. but I couldn't find any video on that. But I saw it documented that she did see a plastic surgeon because she had a lot of issues with her nose. And the doctor said, it, you could die the next time you do cocaine. Holy crap. I remember this one interview that I saw her, um, she said she had developed a big hole in her nose that scared her. And after her tour, she checked into the Betty Ford clinic. Good for her. Yeah. So all in all, she's released eight studio solo albums, seven studio albums with Fleetwood Mac. Rolling Stone named her one of the 100 greatest singers of all time. Rolling Stone also rated rumors number seventh greatest album of all time. Wow. Last thing about Rolling Stone, Landslide, Dreams, and Edge of 17 are on the list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. I got to agree. They're, yeah. they're phenomenal songs. Yep. They're iconic. Yep. Billboard's 200 greatest albums of all time includes that white album, Fleetwood Mac 1975, mm -hmm. Rumors, and Belladonna. Mm-hmm. She was nominated for eight Grammy Awards as a solo artist, holding the record for the most nominations for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance Without a Win, unfortunately. How can she not have won? I don't know. She was also nominated twice as the Best Solo Artist for an American Music Award. However, in 1998, Fleetwood Mac was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. In 2019... She was named the first woman to be inducted for a second time. And she was inducted by her good friend, Harry Styles. At that time, there were 22 people who had been in inducted twice. None of them were women. Wow. So she had said, I definitely broke a big rock and roll glass ceiling. Sure. And then, of course, Tina Turner got inducted for a second time back in 2021. So, but there's only two women. And that's it. That's appalling. Yeah. Yeah, it stinks. That night when she was inducted, she didn't feel well, but she went on stage and sung. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> her speech went on for over 12 minutes. Oh, my goodness. I seen an interview that she said, well, they didn't tell me to leave, so I kept on talking. <laughs> <laughs> but she was so psyched because she, again, the trailblazer thing, she yeah. was like, I'm the first woman. She was mm -hmm. so psyched. So um, she sung. Next day, she ended up in the hospital with double pneumonia. Oh, my goodness. It was a real concern of hers because she did not want to be put on a ventilator. Her mom had been put on a ventilator for about a month. And when she got out, she was so hoarse, she never yeah. got over it. Uh-huh. So, of course, Stevie Nicks is like, I'm Don't put that thing my down my throat. That's yeah. Because right, I'm going to lose my voice. And yeah. that, that's not going to happen. No. So she knows at this point, her lungs have been compromised from that. And of course, now she's just concerned about getting COVID-19. So mm -hmm. she wants nothing to do with the virus. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, one last thing I just want to mention about Stevie Nicks, besides being awesome. She started a charity called Stevie Nicks Band of Soldiers, which benefits wounded military personnel. She visits Army hospitals and Navy hospitals every so often. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So that's about it. Your favorite song? My favorite song is probably Rooms on Fire. And it's not a real really? well-known song, but I really? I really like it. Yeah. I like yeah, it might probably them. landslide, but yeah. um, you know, I've sung Rhiannon many, yeah. many times. Yeah. I, I got to tell you something. I have like a mental block about some of the lyrics on that. She mixes her lyrics up yes, too. Yes, she does. So she changes verses too. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, that, that's my point. That's no. my point. That's my point. <laughs> that so doesn't come like, there. <laughs> I know. I know. Because you, well, and there's a lot of live versions of her stuff out there. Mm -hmm. So, like when you're listening to a song, it's not necessarily the studio album version. Right. It could be any yeah. number of yeah. live versions. Yeah. Like you were saying, even in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there's a version of Landslide that she does there. And it's completely, well, it's not different. completely different, but it's different, it's different. than the, the yeah. studio album. Yeah. So it's like, ah, I messed up. <laughs> it's, different. it's okay. <laughs> you're allowed. I know. Yeah, but you know, as a singer, to mess up a song, yeah, yeah, not you don't so, like it. No, you don't no, like it. No, not no. at all. Whenever I do it, I try to do a studio version yeah. rather than any kind of live well, she variation. Can, yeah, she can take her own. She can do stuff, it. Stuff, right? License exactly. with her own stuff, but you don't want to do right. it when you're covering. Yeah. And before we go, I just wanted to say that Stevie Nicks did a song called "Crystal" mm -hmm. that was on the Practical Magic soundtrack with Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock. Oh, so how about that? Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Love it. Before we wrap up, I just want to mention that Naomi Judd has passed. Yeah, she was what a seventy-six. Shame. Yeah. Winona and Ashley Judd wrote in a statement on Twitter on Saturday that they lost our beautiful mother to the disease of mental illness. Yeah. And they honored her during her induction into the Country Music Hall of Fame on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And they had asked that the induction take place as planned, but the red carpet experience was canceled. Oh. In 2016, Naomi had shared that she'd been diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety. It's just such a shame. It's, it's such a it's terrible shame. Terrible. The Judds had sold more than 20 million records. Mm -hmm. They had won five Grammys and had yeah. 14 number one singles. They had just performed for the first time in years at the CMT Music Awards last month. And they, right. were, they had just announced that uh, they were going on a 10 date final tour scheduled to begin in September. Right. I looked at that performance. They sung Love Can Build a Bridge. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah. And uh, we're so saddened by the loss of this dynamic woman and our heartfelt condolences go to her family, friends, and fans. Absolutely. I have one last thing to mention. Mm. I saw a clip of her interview with Larry King that she had done years and years ago. She was discussing hepatitis C that she had. And she mentioned a quote, and I just want to end it with this quote because I thought it was very fitting and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's not how many breaths you take, it's how many moments take your breath away. Oh, gosh. I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah. A few things before we head out. The NFL just wrapped up their draft. Mm -hmm. And it looks like my Jets did some pretty good choices. They've actually been praised for how well they did. So hopefully in a couple of years, it'll all pan out. Uh, a few more things in sports. My Mets just had a no hitter, the second in Met history. Wow. Yeah, it involved five pitchers, but still it's a no hitter. Mm -hmm. It's called a combined no hitter. Uh, NBA and NHL playoffs have begun. My New York Rangers will be playing the Penguins this week in the first round, so fingers crossed. Oh, and by the way, we had talked about nuts earlier, mm -hmm. and soybeans came up whether they're a nut or not. So for yeah. the record, they are not a nut. I didn't think they were, no. <laughs> yeah. All right, so as we close, lastly, for all moms out there, have a happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. 
We appreciate you listening. With that, we're out of here. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.